Hello, friends. Welcome to the Ryan Pyle Podcast. I am your host, Ryan Pyle. And uh, yeah, coming to you from Dubai, which is becoming a regular place for me to be now. Um, because, as, you know, as we all know, travel is difficult these days. And uh, I have to admit, I'm enjoying kind of just being in Dubai, coming to my office every day, uh, and catching up on some much needed paperwork, which just, you know, it's just too much accounting. And all of that other stuff that comes along with spreadsheets and looking at receipts from months ago and oh, the terribleness of it all. But yes, Dubai. Uh, look, today on the podcast, I'm going to be talking to you about Extreme Treks, the television series that I've been making for several years. Uh, and we actually just um, we won five Asian Academy Awards at the national level and uh, just missed out on winning uh, and were nominated. And in that sense, we were nominated for five Asian Academy Awards uh, for the Extreme Trek series. Uh, and, uh, and I thought it would be nice just to like dedicate an entire episode of the podcast to Extreme Treks. And what I'm thinking about that series and how that series has kind of evolved over the last few years. And, and a lot of you might not know um, how Extreme Treks came to be. So I thought I would um, dedicate a whole episode to that. So I'll get to that in a moment. But, um, you know, let's talk about you. How are you, how, how are you guys all doing out there? And uh, as always, you know, you guys can write me anytime. You can send me an email at studio at ryanpile.com and ask me questions and I'll read them out on the air if you want. And, and I can have a dialogue with all of you, um, even through social media. If you guys have any questions you'd like me, like me to include on the podcast, I'm more than happy to do that. And I'm very happy to make the podcast more interactive, very happy to um, address anyone's questions here on air in my office in Dubai. It's, uh, it's Friday morning at the moment. And uh, it's Friday morning. I usually don't tell people what day it is because I try to I try to make sure these podcasts get out within a day or two of when we record them, but sometimes it takes a little longer, so I don't like to give away which day we're on. Ah, oh, it's good tea, good tea this morning. Um, yeah, so look, how are all you out there doing? We're all in various stages of lockdown. We're all in various stages of quarantines. We're all in various stages of having our daily lives disrupted. And now, um, I guess we can say we're all in various stages of being vaccinated. Um, the United Kingdom is now rolling out a vaccination plan. I saw on BBC the other day, I saw the, the first person in the United Kingdom being vaccinated, who was a 90-year-old woman. And uh, forgive me, I can't remember her name, but uh, I guess that's all happening now. And... Yeah, I guess that's a good thing. Um, you know, for me, the most important thing is just being able to travel and move again. And uh, and whatever kind of gets us back to some semblance of normal is, uh, is good in my eyes. So let's hope that um, whatever, whatever is happening in the world will, will lead us to be able to to travel again and have interactions again and, and to keep learning about people other than ourselves for, for some time in the near future. Uh, how am I doing? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm keeping it together. Um, some days are, are better than others, that's for sure. Um, you know, I'm sitting here in December in Dubai and most times... Most times uh, in December, we've already have quite a lot of jobs lined up for January, February, March, Q1, 2021. At the moment, is looking uh, pretty pretty empty, pretty empty. You know, I think the news of the vaccination is positive, but I think people have long term positivity. But I I also think like people are still quite nervous in the short term. So while you know, while travel might pick up again in late 2021, uh, once these vaccinations, I suppose, are, are are spread out around the world, or at least around the 
Western world, which are probably going to be the first people to get them. Uh, once all of this is kind of done by, I guess, if you follow the news or you believe everything everyone says, that uh, I guess that would be like summer next year. Most people in like the UK or most people in the United States or Western Europe or whatever would would have access to the vaccine if they wanted it. And um, and then I guess, uh, you know, maybe next next fall, next autumn, maybe there would be, um, you know, more, maybe there would be more freedom. And uh, and couldn't we all deal with a little bit of that? But, you know, while that's great, next September, October, November might be amazing. Uh, we still have to get there. And uh, I can tell you that January, February, and March are not looking great work-wise uh, for Ryan Pyle and the crew. You know, it would be great to, you know, be able to hop on a plane and go climb a mountain somewhere. But um, that is uh, increasingly difficult. And even here in the United Arab Emirates, where I am in Dubai, travel between the Emirates. So the United Arab Emirates is like a, is a, a collection of seven Emirates or like seven provinces, let's say. And each one of them is, is uh, independently managed. So I'm in Dubai right now. That's one Emirate. And uh, Abu Dhabi is another Emirate. Uh, and uh, Ras Al Cayman is, is another emirate, but actually travel between the emirates is not entirely easy. And uh, and the United Arab Emirates has a has a, a law where you have to wear a face mask outside at all times. So, you know, does the rock climbing, you know, where does that lead you for trail running and rock climbing and all this kind of stuff? Because that would be quite challenging to do with a mask. So we're looking at doing some local adventures we're looking at just trying to keep busy but obviously we'd love to love to be in nepal or love to be in uh, kenya doing something or maybe south africa but we'll have to see have to see how all that comes together because uh, it won't be easy that's for sure the next few months but we'll have to take uh, we'll have to take a creative look at uh, at how to move forward Someone wrote me on Twitter the other day and was like, hey, you should make Extreme Treks an animated series because then at least you could keep <laughs> keep going with it. And I'm like, yeah, I should just, you know, hire a bunch of people in their home offices to draw a character of me traveling the world and then I can add voiceover and then we could keep making content even while we're locked down. Maybe that's the future. Okay, so, um, yeah, where was I? Extreme treks. Let's get into this. So, uh, for those of you out there who know me, for those of you out there who follow my uh, television career, you'll know that uh, I started making television shows in 2010 when I, when my brother and I rode motorcycles all the way around China, and it was a TV show that was originally called The Middle Kingdom Ride, and then we eventually renamed it Tough Rides China, and then we followed up with Tough Rides India and Tough Rides Brazil. And uh, those were all very successful, and I'm very thankful to everyone that was involved in those projects, and they were very difficult to pull off at the time, uh, and, and and they were really kind of wonderful. And we even had the support of, of, of BMW for, for some of that time, and um, and those were all great partnerships, and, and I am forever grateful. But I, I, I started to realize at some stage that like I was starting to get like a little bit pigeonholed as, as a motorcycle guy. And I'm not. Like, I love riding motorcycles. Don't get me wrong. I love exploring the world on two wheels. Don't get me wrong. But I'm terrified uh, of like opening up an engine or learning the mechanical elements of a motorcycle, even though apparently they're, they're quite easy. If you have a, a, f a fairly standard motorcycle, if you have one of these new motorcycles, it's all computers and stuff like that. And you actually have to like plug the motorcycle into a computer to, um, <laughs> to figure out what's wrong with it. So that is all just terrifying. But if someone shows up, you know, at my house with a nice motorcycle, uh, I would love to ride it around. And, um, and if there's a chance to ride it through the mud or take it through the Amazon jungle, like I did in Brazil, then that could be fun too. But but um, but yeah, but it's funny because you, you make a few TV shows about motorcycle riding and people just think that's all you can do. And I, I, I'm obviously a human being that, that has a lot of interests. 
and and I have a variety of interests. Like I have a lot of different things I like to do, and I have a lot of different things that I'm interested in, and whether it's art or food or nature, or, um, you know, all these things are uh, compel me. So I really wanted to kind of not get pigeonholed into this motorcycle world and 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 follow some of my other interests and i and i think this is you know i'm really glad that i decided to do this because i love you know trekking and climbing and and i've always liked that and and it, oh, when i was in university i didn't really do any trekking and climbing because i was so busy playing basketball all the time and i was just so exhausted you don't really have much of a life because you're just training all the time and then when you're not training you're sleeping or eating and studying i guess and uh and uh, you don't really go and do anything on the weekends because you're playing every weekend or you're training every weekend. So I didn't really have a very um, fulfilling list of hobbies when I was at that age. But but when I went to China, I settled into Shanghai. And, and for those of you who might not know, Shanghai is a mega city of like 30 million people. And it's a concrete jungle. And and I was I was kind of dying in Shanghai um, with how just busy and, and congested everything was. And even though it's a, it's a great city, don't get me wrong, but there's a lot of people. <laughs> like it's a, it was a great city to live and I'm thankful for everything that Shanghai gave me. And, um, and I'm thankful for all the people I met there and all the relationships I had while I was there, but, uh, and relationships that I still have today. Like I still have many friends that still live there, but but it was a it's it's if you're not if you if you love the great outdoors it's a tough place to live so i was living in the city of like 30 million people and i needed to get out and and like you know breathe clean air and 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 walk in grass like those are those were things that i i genuinely felt like i needed on a daily basis and it sounds strange when i say it but uh but that was where like those were like real concerns for me so i have a i have a very good friend his name is brandon zatt and he's an american writer uh screenwriter now um and uh but when i met him you know we were just two freelance journalists and he he was a beautiful writer uh and uh and i was a photographer so we would go out into the wild uh, wilds of China and do travel stories and we would climb mountains together we would visit remote you know villages w that had Catholic churches the the one the Bai Han Lo yeah we did a story once about Bai Han Lo in Yunnan province which is which is a very hard to get to village on the Nujiang River in the Nujiang Valley and uh, I remember we you know it took days to get to this village and we had to get on these buses and then we had to trek up the side of a mountain and but we got to this village and we met the village chief and it turned out they had like a pristine catholic church from the early 1900s that were built by french missionaries and the whole village was catholic and they would go to church every night or once a week or twice a week and the village uh, chief who we stayed with yeah he was the pastor he was the he was the priest and he would lead the service and I remember Brandon and I were there for one of these services, and it was amazing. So, uh, and of course, we wrote a story about it, and, and we published it uh, in in one of the travel magazines in Asia, I think. And um, but that's kind of what Brandon and I used to do, and we loved it. Um, we had the best time, and you know, actually, Brandon and I were chatting last week, and we were reminiscing about Bai Han Lo and some of those places in western china and tibet and stuff like that where we got to trek and travel and hang out and just how lucky and uh, privileged we were to do that at that time because now things are much more difficult traveling in that part of the world both because of covid and uh, because of politics in the region i suppose but uh, so so Brandon and I used to we both lived in Shanghai and we both used to plan these great adventures where we could go out and tell some stories and uh, trek in the mountains and, you know, have some natural experiences and then also uh, mix in the writing and the photography so we can make some money while we were doing it. And of course, this is living the dream. And we were. And it was beautiful. 
and I have to thank Brandon for for kind of digging deep on some of these beautiful treks that we did in the early 2000s because you know he took me to Gongashan which is um uh which is um um Minyakonka which is uh in southern southwestern Sichuan province near Kanding and it's this beautiful mountain and they have this um monastery this tibetan monastery at the at the foothill of the mountain and it's oh man it's just beautiful but to get there it's like a five-day trek and you need like donkeys and you need you know camels so brandon and i were actually doing those trips in 2002 2003 2004 2005 like we were just out there trekking climbing and exploring you know this beautiful part of the world but we were writing and doing photography and it was lovely and then I, I kind of gave up the writing and photography world and started making TV. And then I started, you know, with the motorcycle shows. And then in 2013, after doing Tough Rides China and Tough Rides India, I decided I wanted to get back to those natural roots and, and get back to doing those trips. And I thought that, um, I always thought that like when Brandon and I were out in the wild, that it would make a good TV show. And I always thought, like, we should try to turn these these trips of ours into some kind of television show because we're visiting some amazing places. So in 2013, that's kind of what I did. So, you know, um, I enlisted uh, Chad Ingram, of course, my director of photography, who has shot every episode of television I have ever been in. And uh, he is an absolute legend. Um, and, uh, and, and we decided to go out and do what was originally called Extreme Trek's Sacred Mountains, which was uh, uh, essentially season one of Extreme Treks. And it was a four-episode pilot. And I thought to myself, um, let's give this a try. So is a show about walking in the mountains of Tibet (laughs) compelling? And of course, I went to all of the, you know, networks, Discovery Channel, National Geographic, BBC, Uh, I went to all of them and pitched this, and they all said no. Uh, I asked them for money. They all said no. And then I was like, well, I'll self-fund it, and we'll see what happens. So um, luckily, um, I had Chad, and and we could do it just the two of us. So you can imagine, Chad and I went out, and in, uh, in July... July, August, September, October. Yeah, in July of 2013. Wow, I'm going, I'm reaching way back here. Uh, Seven years ago. In July 2013, we started filming Extreme Treks. And and that's kind of when it all started. Uh, July 2013, yeah. So we did Minyakonka, which is Gongashan in Sichuan province. And that was a six or seven day trek where we started in the village of Kanding. And then we finished... um, at the at the Tibetan monastery in uh, at the foot at the foot of the mountain this like six or seven thousand meter mountain uh, covered in ice and glaciers and god it was beautiful I mean I just I just love those trips so 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 much and uh, being out in that kind of nature was was so beautiful and 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 so special and then in August we went out and we did Amni Mei Chen and Amni Mei Chen is another sacred mountain or Tibetan holy mountain in uh, in Qinghai province, which is in western China. And there we did like a circumnavigation or circumambulation around uh, the mountain there with some local pilgrims. And that was like, a, a again, another five, six day trek. Some people do it in two days, but we took our time because we were shooting and we wanted to really kind of enjoy it. And that was beautiful because that's kind of on this like Tibetan green grassland plateau and then you've got the amni mei chen which is the actual mountain just popping out of the grass and it's just this huge um just mass of ice and rock and it just looks like it shouldn't be there and um and it was amazing and then in september we went to tibet western tibet on the border with nepal and india and we climbed um mount we didn't climb sorry uh climbing there is not allowed we did the, again a circumambulation or a circumnavigation of mount kailash which is uh, considered to be the holiest mountain in the world um 
and it, definitely in Asia. And it's uh, because it's holy not only to Tibetan Buddhists uh, and Tibetan Bon people, but also to um, people of Hindu faith. And maybe also Jan Jainism? Also, I believe, yeah. So a lot of pilgrims come from um, Nepal and India uh, to climb, uh, not to climb, to trek around Mount Kailash. Yeah, climbing is really hard there, and it's actually not allowed. Um, so one thing you should know about all these sacred mountains is is people don't climb them for the most part because it's kind of sacrilegious to the local Tibetans. Um, they do kind of a circumambulation or they walk around the mountain on like an established pilgrimage route in order to show their respect. But to climb them would be not good because the, the summit is kind of uh, sacred just for the gods. That's where that comes from, where that uh, no climbing rule comes from. So if you were to climb Mount Kailash, which is like the holiest mountain, for Tibetan Buddhist people, um, yeah, you would you'd be not forgiven ever. So it's a terrible thing. And, and to, to my knowledge, Mount Kailash has never been climbed. But the um, the three or four day circumambulation around the mountain is intense because the entire trek is up like a, around four and a half five thousand meters above sea level, which is like thirteen to sixteen thousand feet, and it de never dips below that. So if you have altitude on day one, if you have altitude sickness on day one, chances are you're going to have altitude sickness for four days. And, uh, and it is a, a tough, tough uh, journey. And we did that in September 2013. And then our last mountain that we did was Karwa Karpo in southern Yunnan province on the border with Myanmar. And the, the Chinese name for that mountain is Meili Shuishan. And that is like a 200 kilometer, like 12 day circumambulation around that mountain, which dips you like right along the border with Myanmar. And that is a stunning, stunning part of the world and a stunning mountain. And, um, and that was, so that was it. Those were my four sacred mountains for Extreme Trek's Sacred Mountains Season 1. So we did, um, we did Minya Konka in Sichuan, Amni Mei Chen in Qinghai, Mount Kailash in Tibet, and Karwa Karpo in Yunnan. And that was the pilot. And I thought to myself, if I can, if I can do like a four-episode pilot and show people that walking through nature is compelling for 46 minutes, then, um, then maybe I can do this all over the world. And maybe people will let me do it all over the world. And maybe that's something that, maybe that's something that's something. <laughs> maybe that's something instead of nothing. Uh, so I was kind of, I don't know, I guess I kind of wanted to create a, a different genre of television or, you know, people have done these like trekking shows before, but a lot of them are like one-offs or, or a lot of people have done like survival shows where they're trying to teach you like how to survive or people do like competition shows where it's like, we're all stuck and we have to find our way out and who's going to get out first. And I, I respect all those shows. I think they're great entertainment value, um, but I don't want to make them. And this is what I wanted to do with my time, <laughs> and it turns out with my life. So, so I really wanted to create a genre of television that that I could do that I I really liked doing, and being out in the wild and being out in nature and sleeping in tents and stuff like that was amazing. And this kind of first season of Extreme Treks with these sacred mountains in Tibet, only four episodes. Um, I made them without any broadcaster support and without any backing and without any corporate sponsors as a proof of concept. And, you know, sometimes you just have to do that. I, 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 I struggle with people who don't make things because they feel like people won't won't like what they make i think you just have to make shit and make shit that you like and then get people to to like it i mean why do i keep swearing you know the ratings on my apple podcast thing are all explicit and people are getting upset at me because they're like you swear too much and i'm just like you know it's like 7 30 in the morning i'm in my office i'm trying to lay down some stuff and sometimes the words don't come so smoothly so i apologize for the cursing yes Let's pull this back here. Sometimes you just have to make stuff, the stuff that you want to make, <laughs> and get people to like it. 
because people don't know what they want. <laughs> that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Isn't it Steve Jobs that said that? Like, you know, it's not Apple's job to make what people want. It's Apple's job to show people what they want, show people something new that they want. Um, and I, I, th I think that's, you know, that's what, that's what our job should be as entertainers. Our job should be to keep telling new stories and showing people what we like in the effort that they'll like it. But all we actually keep doing is just making the same stuff again and again and again with the same themes, with a slight twist, uh, the various competition shows or survival shows. And, 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 you know, these are the ratings grabbers. So this is the rut that we're in as a creative society. And, and that's, you know, yeah, I don't know. Television broadcasters have to have advertising ratings to sell advertising, to pay wages, to fund television. So um, it's not my role to say it's a poisoned model, but it feels a little, it feels a little poisoned. Was that, was that my morning jadedness coming through? You know, I, I've had my morning coffee, but I still feel, still feel a little jaded out there. But, um, but yes, yeah, so I made Extreme Trek season one, Sacred Mountains without any support, without anyone even telling me that they would take it afterwards. Like I was even offering it for free to some broadcasters once I had paid for it and completed it on my own. And they were humming and hawing about maybe. And, um, and I just feel like, God, like that was tough. Um, those were tough days, but anyways, it ended up taking me like a year to make you know, we did four sacred mountains in four months. So uh, we were two weeks on, two weeks off, July, August, September, October, 2013. It was, it was 2014 by the time we had edited everything. And then I believe it aired on Discovery Channel Asia, October, 2014. And it ran for like two years. Okay. Didn't make any money. Uh, lost a lot of money, but two things happened. Uh, one is I met David Harris and David Harris is my editor and post-production supervisor. And just, um, you know, he is my creative collaborator on extreme treks and, uh, we see eye to eye so, so well. And without his editing and without his post-production supervising and, and without his tone, of how he edits and how we work together. Extreme Treks would not be the show that it is today. And, um, and that Extreme Trek Sacred Mountain season one really let David and I find the DNA for what Extreme Treks is today. So for that, I'm forever grateful. And then it also showed Chad and I, Chad, my director of photography, that uh, we could actually film in the mountains without electricity for days on end. And we figured out ways of managing the infrastructure of filming to, to do that. And we figured out what, what we needed. And we, and we put together really the, the idea that this could be done. And we loved it because what's better than like trekking 20 kilometers a day and sleeping in a tent and, and making a living doing that. So we were, we were pumped. And even though Extreme Trek's Sacred Mountain season one lost money, even though no one wanted to work with us, even though we had no corporate support um, we still made it and in the process of making it we created the dna for the extreme trek show that you all watch on bbc now or on amazon prime uh, the global series and and that's kind of what it took and you know that building that creative platform uh, cost a lot of money and uh, took a huge amount of time and was very painful and painstaking at every turn. But, um, but that's, I don't know, that's kind of what it takes. Like I, I, I have this overarching belief in my world. <laughs> and then some of you might agree or disagree that, uh, good things are painful. Like, uh, if you're going through life and everything is just kind of, you know, easy, 
you're not doing life right. I think, um, you know, and some people want an easy life and I'm not judging you. So let me, let me rephrase that. What I, what I really want to say is if you're going through life and everything's going really great, the chances are you're not trying to do anything too out of the, out of the ordinary or, or push the envelope or, or trying to do anything, um, original, let's say, uh, because in order to do original things in order to push the envelope in order to change the narrative you are going to face an uphill battle you're going to face the naysayers you're going to have people that don't listen you're going to have people that won't want to work with you you're going to have all of these challenges that you kind of have to work your way through and and this is this whole idea of like not staying in your comfort zone because if you stay in your comfort zone all the time nothing happens it's only when you go outside your comfort zone and you try to change yourself or change you know the direction you're headed in uh, that you cause friction and friction is difficult and hard and painful and challenging and you'll make enemies i suppose or uh, and and that's you know that's just part of the part of the journey so with this extreme trek series you know, I really wanted to spend time out in nature. I really thought the stories that can be found out on these trails in the middle of nowhere with the guides and the porters and the pack animals and the nature and the evenings and the sunsets and the glaciers and the hailstorms and climbing high mountains and the personalities that exist all around this. I thought that this would make a great TV show, um, but no one else really saw it. And, and I'm forever grateful that David Harris, my my editor and post-production supervisor and, and Chad Ingram, my director of photography, I'm forever grateful that they bought in because, uh, because you know, make no mistake, um, I don't live in a vacuum and I'm not a one-man show. Uh, I have amazing creative collaborators that I work with and, um, and you know, everything we do is a I wouldn't say it's a consensus. Sometimes I just go off and do my own thing, but so, you know, it's definitely a partnership that I'm um, I'm thankful for. A creative partnership that I'm forever grateful for. So, so Sacred Mountain season one was really painful, and uh, but I, but it was a proof of concept. And sometimes you have to pay and go through a huge personal challenge to 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 bring about that proof of concept. So. With that in my pocket, <laughs> with that stuffed into my back pocket and getting it on Discovery Channel, which again, just proved to people like the quality was high enough to get it on Discovery Channel, that, um, that we were able to go out into the world now and maybe make um, this show global. So something else happened here too. Um, when I was younger, you know, I lived in China for a long time and I lived in Shanghai and I made my first few TV shows about China and I loved China and I had this idea of just like making television shows all about China all the time like like I just wanted to make I think at one stage and I might have been drinking at you know at this night in this evening when I said this but like I wanted to make a hundred episodes about China uh, across multiple t like television genres because I had worked for like the New York Times and Time Newsweek Forbes and Fortune I'd worked for all these publications for so many years and I loved telling stories about China and I knew the stories in China were just ridiculous and off the hook and hilarious and fun and terrifying and, and everything in between so I knew China had all the content that I would ever need to make to make television the problem is the audience. Uh, the audience does not want to see a lot of China. So I used to have these, when I was doing Extreme Trek's Sacred Mountains, I had, um, I told people like, I'm going to be doing these four sacred mountains in Tibet and they're all holy mountains and they're all kind of located, you know, within the internationally recognized borders of China. And then people were like, well, why don't you you know, do one episode in one country and do four different treks in four different parts of the world so the television audience has some variety. And I was like, no, 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 you, you got to do them all in China. And I was like, those were arguments I had. And then once I did Sacred Mountains and once I got it broadcast, I, I, I really did believe after that that I needed to go global and make global television because the audience does want to see a variety of landscapes and cultures and people. 
and you know the audience is is king so we we had to kind of give them what they wanted so so by season two of extreme treks season one was the pilot with the four mountains in tibet and then season two we went global with it and we had a proof of concept and we knew it worked and we knew it looked good and we knew that the story was flowing so we went global with it so in season two we filmed in tanzania we climbed mount kilimanjaro we went to Morocco and trekked through the Atlas Mountains and finished with a summit of Mount Tubkal. We went to Glacier National Park in the United States. We went to Peru, um, to Machu Picchu. And we went to Nepal and we went through the Mustang Kingdom. And then we went to Italy and we did uh, a bit of a historical journey through the World War One battleground of the Dolomites around Cortina, and then uh, we finished up with uh, the Al Hajar Mountains in Oman. So that was season two. So we had a little South America, a little Asia. Oh, we also did the China episode, which was in the Taklamakan Desert. Okay, we walked across deserts. I don't know why I keep walking across deserts. I've probably talked a lot about. How I feel about walking across deserts and how painful it is. But um, yeah, that was season two of Extreme Treks. Tanzania, Morocco, China, the USA, Peru, Nepal, Italy, and Oman. So we had a little of everything. We had some Middle East, we had some Africa, we had South America, we had North America, we had Asia. We had it all. And, um, and the journeys were very compelling. You know, I think with season one Extreme Treks, uh, sacred mountains the journeys were spiritual and because we were on a essentially we were on like a religious pilgrimage with people and we had to be sensitive about that and and try to tell that story but in season two um you know the religious element was definitely dropped in most cases but then a new spirituality kind of rose to the surface where just being out in nature was like spiritual and connecting with nature and sleeping in tents and, and experiencing the world disconnected from society, from civil society and just being out in the wild. And that was amazing, man. Like that was, whew. <laughs> that blew my mind, man. It was, um, it was, it was just, it was just awesome. And when we were doing season two, I knew I was really onto something because it just felt so good to be out in all these places. And I love traveling and I loved meeting our guides and working with our guides to solve problems. And I loved the porters who would help us carry all of our things all around. And, you know, and, and it just worked and I was happy and my crew were happy. And David, my editor was happy because we were just sending him back incredible footage and people had no idea how we were filming, you know, in such remote places without, without electricity. And, you know, we figured out ways to do that. I'm not going to tell you how we do it, but yes, we, we figured out how to do it and it was just awesome. So season two was really like a breakout moment. And, and it's funny because season two went to BBC. So Discovery Channel, Asia, broadcasted extreme trek sacred mountains because it had china content and china content does well on discovery asia so they purchased extreme trek season one <laughs> but then season two was too global for discovery asia to pick it up <laughs> too global i didn't know that was a thing uh they really fo the discovery asia really has a focus on asian content and and they have their own reasons and they have their own research and they know what works for them so that's fine but it's funny that season one was very china focused so discovery asia took it and then season two was like too global so they didn't want it so then bbc asia took it okay so bbc asia doesn't show a lot of asian content they show a lot of global content to people in asia <laughs> so it works so discovery asia for those of you who aren't in the television industry, you'll have difficulty really following along. But people who are in the television industry, you know exactly what I'm talking about and how we just rack our brains against this landscape every day. But yeah, so some some broadcasters 
they get better ratings when they show local content, you know, local regional content in their local region. And then some broadcasters know they'll get better ratings when they show global content to the people in their region. So everyone has like their own niche. And when you're making content, you know, it's helpful to know what's going on. So I actually went into Extreme Trek Season 2 without broadcaster support again. Whew. Yeah, like that was a tough one. And I went to Discovery Channel and I said, hey guys, you guys took Extreme Trek Season 1. Let's take this global can you pay for it? And can you give me some up front um, so I can make a living doing what I'm doing? And they said no. Um, but the, let's not harp too much on Discovery Channel because they gave me a wonderful series last year called Expedition Asia where we made 10 episodes all around Asia. And it was absolutely beautiful and it's been rating really well. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that we're having chances to collaborate now. But back then... It was tough. It was tough. And um, so for Extreme Trek Season 2, uh, no one wanted it. Even BBC didn't want it before I shot it because I had approached them too. And um, and then I went out and shot it. And again, it was like a year of... It was eight, eight episodes. Um, and it was like a year and a half to turn all that around. And then eventually BBC saw it and liked it and they liked how it focused on nature and, and the natural world and, and, and how it focused on culture and it wasn't like a, a reality show and it wasn't a survival show and it wasn't a competition show. So those ticked all the boxes for BBC. And, uh, and that's how we got it out on BBC Earth. And now if you're sitting in Hong Kong or Singapore at 9 p.m. on a Wednesday night, you can probably turn on the TV and I'll be there climbing some mountain or walking across some desert. So season two, when we took it global, that's what kind of got BBC hooked. Uh, and then it started rating well. And then when we went into season three, BBC said, yes, we'll take a season three. So that was great to have some broadcaster support before I filmed. <laughs> I do everything backwards, people. Most production companies in this world, they wait for productions to come in. They wait for money to come in and then they execute. But... Um, I'm a little bit all over the place and I haven't figured out how not to be all over the place and still make the content I want to make. So I guess what I'm really saying is I have uh, difficulty compromising. Maybe I'm still working on that, but it's too early. So we'll come back to that at a later date, but um, that could be a whole other podcast is my inability to compromise. Yes. Okay. Where were we? Yeah, so season two went out on BBC Earth. It was successful. We had a good run. Um, ratings were good. And then um, I said, I'm going to do season three. And they said, great. So I got um, Chad and David back on board. And, and we went out and did season three. One thing I should also mention, too, is in season one of Extreme Treks, it's, that's the Sacred Mountains one, it, it literally was just Chad and I. My Chad, my director of photography, and I like carrying tripods and cameras through the mountains of Tibet, filming a television show. Um, by season two, we had brought on a, a very young and uh, talented uh, cinematographer, Jesse Rosenberg, who was fresh out of NYU. He joined our crew as a second cameraman. And Chad and Jesse worked really well together, and the dynamic was great. And Jesse loves hiking and climbing and the great outdoors and trekking and everything like that. So so it, it just was a really good fit. And having two cameramen, having, you know, twice the footage, having, you know, better, better um, engagement with the local people and having that covered better with two cameras just made the show um, much more compelling and higher quality. So the dynamic of Chad and Jesse in the field with the cameras, with our exotic locations, and then having David edit it um, with our, you know, with with having David and I had the experience of, of putting together the DNA for Extreme Treks in season one. I don't know, it just kind of all worked. And that was great. So the addition of Jesse was very valuable. And then um, and then in season three, we had everyone back. So we had Jesse and Chad and, and David Harris back. And it was really just the four of us. And... Um, and we went out in season three and we did Russia, 
we climbed Mount Elbrus. Uh, we went Iceland. Uh, we walked across the highlands, um, the central highlands of, of Iceland, which is a uh, very, very challenging terrain. And then we went to we went to Laos. Yeah, and we uh, walked through the villages of the Akai people. And then we went to Papua New Guinea, and we trekked along the Kokoda Trail, which was a, a historical battleground between the Australians and Japanese in World War II. And Papua New Guinea is a tough place to film. <laughs> it's a tough place to do anything. Let's be honest. Okay, so that's Russia, Iceland, Laos, Papua New Guinea. Oh, yeah, and then we did Bolivia and Argentina. Um, and in Bolivia, we did Huayna Potosi, which is a 6,000-meter peak. But we did it in a really interesting way because we did the... We started in the jungle, and then we finished on the summit of Huayna Potosi, which is a 6,000-meter peak. So we, we started in the lowlands at like 1,000 meters above sea level, and we trekked along these beautiful trails through these like little small villages and stuff, and then we made it to the top of the peak. So we saw like every climatic zone uh, that exists in the world, which was really cool, and the flora and fauna was really different everywhere, and it was, it was quite stunning. Um, but the reason we went to Bolivia to climb Huayna Potosi is because right after that, we went to Argentina and climbed Aconcagua, which is the highest mountain in um, South America at, seven, uh, at about 7,000 meters, 6,985 or something like that. And, um, and Huayna Potosi is a good mountain to climb before you do Aconcagua. Uh, a lot of people like they do Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania and then they try to do Aconcagua. Don't do that. Don't do that. You're just going to hurt yourself. Um, go do Huayna Potosi in Bolivia because it's a, a proper ice mountain. Um, there's a few little technical stages. You need crampons. You need ice axes. Uh, and the weather is quite similar, and it's cold. And the key at Aconcagua is it's really, really cold and windy. And when you climb Kilimanjaro in Tanzania, you're on the equator and uh, it's not very cold and it's not very windy. It's a tough climb. Uh, a lot of people do it. A lot of people don't do it. A lot of people are successful. A lot of people get altitude sickness, all of the above. Everything's fine. Uh, I'm not judging anyone, but don't think that you're going to do the seven summits on seven continents and start with Kilimanjaro and then make the next mountain you climb Aconcagua because they are totally different beasts. So we went to Bolivia and we did Huayna Potosi. Uh, as a as a kind of warm up for Aconcagua, and then we went to Argentina and did Aconcagua, uh, which was amazing. We all made that and were successful. And then, and then we went to Jordan and we trekked across the Wadi Rum Desert, uh, which is that beautiful red desert in southern Jordan near the border with Saudi Arabia. And then we went to Uganda and finished off season three with uh, gorilla trekking in the Bawindi National Park in southern Uganda on the border with the Democratic Republic of Congo. And that was season three. And that was amazing. Yeah, that was really cool, man. I don't know, that might have been like one of the highlights. That was probably one of the best seasons of, t of TV I've ever made, maybe. And um, the locations are just amazing. And the <clears throat> the mood and the excitement every time we went out was, 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 was incredible. And, the, you know, Chad and Jesse really shot everything just to perfection and, and David David put it all together in post and and you know the way we crafted voiceover and the way we put together the episodes was just amazing and and uh, extreme trek season three uh, we we felt so good about it that we, we put it into the Asian Academy Awards um, in their television division and uh, and we ended up winning the national level awards uh, and then which means we get nominated for the Asia wide award. And so, um, by winning the local awards, we won five of them, uh, best director for me, best cinematography for Chad, best editing for David Harris, best lifestyle presenter for me and best, uh, best entertainment nonfiction series. So we got five national level awards and then that meant we got nominated for the Asia wide awards. And, um, and they just had those last week, and we lost all five, um, mostly just to huge productions, um, huge like broadcast-driven commercial productions. We lost tw twice to Bear Grylls. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people lose to Bear Grylls, so it's fine. And uh, and we lost to yeah, we lost a bunch to Discovery Channel 
um, for their few of their epic productions. But but all all in all, um, very proud that um, Extreme Trek season three was kind of nominated for five Asian Academy Awards because we were definitely the only independent television series nominated. We were definitely the only independent television series even listed. Uh, and I don't know. Did, did anyone notice? Did anyone talk about independent television? Did anyone talk about non-commercially driven television or non-advertorial television? It's, um, it's, it's interesting. But, you know, definitely all of the other productions that were in uh, and that we were up against were big budget uh, productions that were well funded by broadcasters. And we were just kind of going out there and giving it our best shot and, uh, and very honored to, um, to have had the chance to, to have, you know, had our little show get nominated for so many awards. And, um, and that's, that's why I wanted to dedicate today's podcast to Extreme Treks because uh, we've just had this award season go by and we were nominated for five awards and I wanted to reminisce about how Extreme Treks came to be and maybe you guys watch Extreme Treks and you've seen it on TV and you think wow that must be easy for that man to make that show Um, but obviously it's not nothing is easy Uh, and uh, and I wanted to give everyone the background to uh to how extreme trek sacred mountains happened and to how extreme trek season two came to be and how we took it global and added jesse and chad uh and then how season three you know in some ways was the pinnacle and and how we were nominated for five five asian wide academy awards against the giants and so that's kind of where we are at the moment and uh, for those of you who have been following along on my podcast or on my social media, you will know that I, I started filming Extreme Trek Season 4 this year. Oh, 2020 has just been a bit shitty, but um, but uh, it's been a lot more shitty for a lot more people. So I am uh, I am grateful for everything I have and everything that uh, that we've been able to do this year. But I know it's just been terrible for everyone and... Uh, much harder for most people than me. So I'm humble uh, and thankful for, for every day. Um, but but I like making TV, and when I can't, I just get angry. Um, but um, So I was filming Extreme Trek Season 4 this year. So I had gone to Myanmar in February. I had gone to Ethiopia in March, where I got stuck uh, in Ethiopia, and then Istanbul for four months. Uh, and then I went out and did a double episode of Extreme Treks in Switzerland, where I walked across Switzerland, the Via Alpina, 390 kilometers. And then I filmed another episode of Extreme Treks in Poland, in the Tatra Mountains, which was magical. So I've got five episodes now. What's that? Myanmar, Ethiopia, double episode in Switzerland for Poland, five. I have five episodes of Extreme Treks right now currently being edited in post-production, various stages of post-production. And I'm sitting here in my office in December in Dubai, and I have no idea. (laughs) Don't tell BBC. (laughs) I have no idea how I'm going to film the next three episodes of Extreme Treks just so I can finish season four. (sighs) I have no idea. I mean, you know, I'm in the UAE. I could definitely do an episode here. Um, But I can't do three episodes in the UAE. And I'm in the Middle East. I could do three episodes in the Middle East, but they're all going to kind of look the same. Um, You know, I think part of what makes Extreme Treks uh, successful, you know, today, uh, and and especially following up with with how well we did uh, with season three in in the awards world and with ratings and stuff like that, um, people are expecting a, a global television show. And... And uh, people are expecting to see lots of different parts of the world. And right now it's just really hard to travel and hard to do anything. So, so I've got three episodes of Extreme Treks that I'm still trying to do. And I'm kind of stuck in Dubai. And I don't know when we'll be able to go out and do anything. 
And um, yeah, it's kind of, it's the first time that's, I mean, obviously, <laughs> oh, when people talk about 2020 and then they're like, it's the first time I didn't have anything to do, or it's the first time I had to work from home, or it's the first time I didn't know how to make TV. It's the first time I lost my job. It's the first, obviously, this is the first global pandemic that we're all living through in various stages. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so let me finish my stupid sentence. Uh, it's the first time I've started filming an Extreme Trek season and not known how to end it. <laughs> so, so welcome, welcome to my problems, um, which are not real problems, I know. Uh, so yeah, so uh, if anyone out there from the BBC is listening to my podcast, please just ignore the last bit. I'll get you eight episodes somehow, some way. Um, and hopefully we can try to find some places to film where we can just get out and social distance and still explore our beautiful world because, uh, because I'm a happier person in general <laughs> when I'm filming <laughs> and working and climbing and trekking and being outside. So ah, that is where I wanted to go today. I wanted to take all of you on the journey that Extreme Treks has been. And I wanted to talk about this now with uh, the success we've had at the recent Asian Academy Awards. And, you know, we, we, you know, we're, we, we run the show in the United States, you know, we're going to be, uh, you know, we're, we're um, in the competition for the Emmys, we're in the competition for the Peabody, we're in the competition for uh, BAFTA, like, because we broadcast all around the world. So we're, we're in a lot of different competitions. And the, the Asian Academy Awards is really the first, the, the next round of awards are coming up um, next year, and we'll see early next year, and we'll see how Extreme Treks does um, in those other international awards. But, um, but yeah, very proud of our little show um, that no one wanted. And, and I think that that's just a I don't know. There's there's lessons in this struggle uh, that I definitely apply to every element of my life, and um, and there are things that I talk about when I give, you know, in my speaking events. There are things that I talk about by myself when I'm with you in my little confessional booth of an office, which is starting to feel like that actually, just me sitting here talking to all of you. Um, and yeah, I mean, expect, I just expect things to be hard all the time. Um, and I think that that helps me, uh, be more successful. And, and I feel like when I have a good idea and people don't support it, I feel like it's an idea that I have to run with because people don't, when you bounce ideas off of people or you ask people to fund your ideas, they want things that are easy and they want things that are bite size and they want things that they can feel comfortable investing in or, or doing. And, and you're coming to them with moonshots and extreme treks was a moonshot. I mean, you should have heard my first few sales pitches. Like I'm going to be trekking mountains and we're going to climb this 5,000 meters something. And we're going to bring the 4k. It's all 4k. We're going to have drones, you know, like <laughs> maybe I, I don't know when I, when I think about it, how I pitched it originally, maybe I just didn't pitch it well. And, uh, maybe secretly it was all my fault, but, but, um, but it, you know, it ended up kind of working out and, and it was, a. It was a labor of love, and it still is a labor of love. And all the television shows that I make are all independent now. Um, I haven't had a commissioned television show in years since 2000. I don't know. I did one show for Discovery Channel in China. Uh, Shanxi, China's Great Gateway. Um, I think that was like 2012, maybe. Uh, but I've just been doing my own thing for, for quite a long time now, and... And I like it, and um, and apparently all of you like it, and uh, you know we get we rate well, and we got nominated for five Asian Academy Awards. So it's it's been a great testament to um, passion and to not letting people turn you away from your great ideas. 
I think, uh, I don't know what my world would be like if I didn't have extreme treks in it because, you know, it keeps me balanced. It keeps me happy. It's, uh, the show I love to make. It's, it's all of that. And, uh, and, you know, I hope, uh, I hope this little TV show also plays a role in your life as well. When you've had a tough day at the office and you can just come home and, you know, nine or 10 PM at night, you can just pop on and, and see where in the world I might be. And, uh, and kind of fall away into that, into that world that, uh, that we create. Uh, and I hope that that's a nice escape for, for you after a, a tough day. Um, because it's my escape. <laughs> it's my escape from the real world. It's my escape from, uh, corporate life. It's my escape from, from, uh, the society we've created for ourselves. It's my escape from, from just get, letting me live a different life. And, uh, and spending time out in nature, which I love and keeps me balanced and keeps me happy. So, uh, I want to thank you all for, for listening today. I want to thank you all for joining me, uh, and allowing me to reminisce about my, uh, about my journey of extreme treks. And like I said, we are a little more than halfway done filming extreme trek season four, and I don't know how it's going to end. So, I'd love to say there's more episodes of Extreme Treks coming your way in 2021, but I don't really know. Um, I would like to finish eight and put out eight, but uh, we got five and we'll see how it goes. But uh, anyways, guys, thank you all very much for tuning in and, uh, and thank you all for listening to me talk about Extreme Treks, my, uh, my favorite TV show that I get to make. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Okay, everyone. How, how'd you like that? Huh? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm still in my office. I'm still in Dubai, but I did have to take a step back <laughs> from, from that podcast and, uh, and, you know, walk around and shake off the seriousness of it all. I mean, um, uh, yeah, when I talk about my TV shows and I remember how difficult all those early moments were, um, it does get a little heavy and, and intense. And I, I hope you are able to, uh, stay with me on that, and I hope you enjoy it, and I hope you respect uh, the process. Yeah, because, you know, I hope you watch the show and you like it, and I hope you respect the process, and I hope you enjoy the final product, because, um, you know, that's what it's all about. I'm here to entertain. Uh, as always, folks, you can be following me on Instagram at Ryan Pyle. You can also write to the show at studio at ryanpyle.com, R-Y-A-N-P-Y-L-E.com, and ask questions. I would love to make this podcast more interactive. Um, as always, I'm doing as many podcasts as I can, but it is going to be a little bit harder with guests and social distancing and stuff like that over the coming days and weeks. So I'm hoping to still bring in some interesting people um, and, and still kind of getting at them and at their lives. But, um, but thank you again for tuning in. And of course you can get this podcast anywhere you get your podcasts. And they're also on my YouTube channel, which is uh, Ryan J pile. Uh, And what else do I have to, to promote or to say? No, I think I'm good. Are you guys good? I'm good. I feel pretty good about that. Um, it was nice to reminisce and to go go down memory lane. And uh, thank you all for tuning in today. And we'll get another one of these out sometime soon. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.